afternoon, I'm Dave Pearson of Star Renewable Energy. We're a Scottish uh, industrial refrigeration company. Uh, also, and uh, specifically, Star Renewable Energy is focused on large heat pumps, ammonia heat pumps. And I'm here in Portland, uh, Oregon, in the United States, with Derek Hamilton of Sheco. And uh, Derek and I used to work together at Star Refrigeration. Derek was design manager on the job for Dramon, which is a district heating heat pump. Uh, 13 megawatts, 90 degrees C, 194 Fahrenheit, and that's uh, delivering heat for the central business district in the Norwegian town of Dramon. The heat source being the Fjord. Uh, Fjord's only 8 degrees C, and um, we're delivering uh, an efficiency of over three, so we're getting three units of heat for every one unit of electricity. The United States clearly is uh, a, a huge market uh, in terms of heating and cooling. They're also on a massive drive towards uh, natural working fluids. The reasons for these tend to get uh, stated as uh, environmental reasons, but actually when you when you dig into it, there's massive economic reasons for making plant that lasts longer, making plant that uses less electricity, making plant that needs less uh, maintenance. Uh, generally, just uh, making better plant is a huge business opportunity uh, for for uh, the end users, uh, and that's that's a major uh, observation that we have as to why the market is growing so fast in the U.S. We came down to the waterfront today in Portland because uh, it's it's very similar to many other cities. If you think of uh, most of the cities uh, across the the western and eastern seaboard, um, you know they've got access to the, a huge resource. There's enough heat in the water in the, in the river here uh, to heat the central business district in Portland 10 times over, maybe more. Uh, basically we can harvest heat without any detriment to the, the river water environment and deliver that heat in district heating to the central business district. The added benefit is that we're able to deliver cooling as well. So instead of having individual units on the rooftops of, of most of the buildings, we can aggregate these into a, a, a district energy system. Um, district energy is not uh, a new, new term, the, the International District Energy Association in the United States has been active for many, many years, lots of great businesses. What we need to see though is that they move towards not just uh, cooling and heating uh, principally from hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, but they'll, they'll increase the energy efficiency by around about 25% by moving to natural working fluids. So imagine as a business, if you can drop the cost of your energy consumption by 25%, that's a massive benefit in using natural working fluids and that's you know it was a key reason why star got involved in the project in Dramon was that we we could reduce the energy consumption by 25 percent using using ammonia as a working fluid if they're more efficient obviously they're using less electricity and therefore the carbon efficiency is down so just as the cost of running is down by 25 percent the carbon footprint is down by 25 percent even just for the for the same light for light. If we're comparing it to burning natural gas, as most buildings do, natural gas has a, a carbon footprint of around about 225 grams per kilowatt hour of uh, thermal energy delivered. Running a heat pump with the efficiency of three, what we call a coefficient of performance of three, uh, means you basically take the carbon footprint of the electricity and divide by three. In the case of the UK, that has traditionally been around about 550 grams, so we'd be uh, around about 180. If you look at the carbon footprint in the UK, it was historically about 550 grams. It's dropped now to about 350. So if we're taking 350 and dividing by the efficiency of the heat pump, let's say three, we're, we're down at uh, a carbon footprint less than half of burning gas. And that's a significant benefit. And that's not even including the fact that we're doing useful cooling. You know, burning gas in a gas furnace doesn't deliver cooling, whereas running a heat pump delivers heating and cooling simultaneously. And that's what society generally tends to be. It's some heating and some cooling pretty much all year round. You know, the emphasis moves from one season to the other, but most of the year you're needing a bit of both. I think when you take a, a life cycle view on it, you know, let's say 20 or 30 years for the deployment of this, there, there, there's significant uh, tax as well involved in, in fossil fuels, which is, is continuously being, being looked at. But basically, uh, taking fossil fuels, let's even just say we took fossil fuel and generated our own electricity, and we got an efficiency of 40% from that unit of fossil fuel, compared to burning that same unit at 85% efficient, generating electricity from fossil fuel and then running a heat pump on that is round about two and a half times more efficient than just the, the, you know, the, 
base consumption of fossil fuels. So, you know, there's a much bigger picture than just saying what's the instantaneous uh, uh, footprint for this. So, you know, throw in the cooling effect of this as well. There's, there's significant uh, earnings to be had in being a grid balancing device. So in the UK, we're seeing an opportunity to uh, switch on the heat pumps to help balance the grid. You know, if the grid is getting a surplus of electricity generation, you switch on devices, you can help balance that, balancing the frequency, a technique called uh, firm frequency response. Equally, if the grid's getting a little bit stressed, a little bit too much demand versus supply, then you can switch off the heat pump and then the, the entire thermal network that's in the city becomes a big thermal store, a big energy store. And whilst lots of people are talking about uh, storage of energy in, in batteries and chemical batteries, actually storing energy and heat is the cheapest form of doing that. So I think there's a much bigger picture than just what's the instantaneous cost of one unit of gas. The European economy is importing a billion euros a day of fossil fuel and that's clearly disadvantageous from a macroeconomic perspective. That's a huge amount of, of money that's being spent to buy fossil fuels and in the European context half of that is burnt for heating. So every day we're burning half a billion euros of, of fuel and the following day we go out and buy another half billion euros. I mean that's a massive drain on the economy. Um, we're not short of resource. Heat pumps are fairly simple uh, in, in the sense you've got to have a heat source, the river behind me, as I mentioned earlier, you've got a heat demand, the city that's in front of me, and a device in between that's, that's generating a commercial benefit for, for the operator. You, know, you join those three things together and you get a significant advantage in, in what we're talking about. So how, how big is the prize? I, I really don't think it's, it's going to be constrained by the heat source, which is, is huge. The heat demand is huge. We just need to start doing this uh, and, and getting as much benefit as we can, creating lots of jobs and infrastructure. You know, clearly uh, buying buying fossil fuels and just burning it isn't isn't necessarily a huge jobs uh, piece compared to the infrastructure opportunities of of putting distant heating pipe in, uh, building heat pumps. Uh, you know, running these systems is from a jobs perspective far more advantageous than simple combustion.